Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, on this beautiful day in Rancho Mirage. Uh, this is the City Council meeting, which includes the Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. So this is our regular meeting, and it is Thursday, October 2nd, and it is now just after 1 o'clock. So we will begin with the calling uh, to order from me, which I just done, did, whatever, and now our flag salute, which is going to be led by uh, Sarah Stapleton from our IT department. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, now, if Cindy will call roll. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. And Mayor Smotrich? Here. Okay. So, moving right along, our first presentation that was going to be done by Ted, from what I understand, is not going to be taking place today, but we'll wait until next time. Yeah, but Ted is here. Ted is here, yeah. yes. How fortunate we are. <laughs> okay, so we will continue on to other presentations, and uh, this one is a, a very important one to our city, needless to say, and it is um, the presentation of um, a proclamation designating October 5 through 11 as Fire Protection Week. And... Um, so just as a little introduction before I come down in front, uh, next week is Fire Prevention Week. And as we do with every year to help raise awareness for this important event, we are presenting a proclamation to our fire department acknowledging Fire Prevention Week. This year we are highlighting the importance of installing and maintaining a smoke detector. So I would like to call Fire Battalion Chief Casey Hartman and the other firefighters present to come up to the front of the room to discuss smoke alarms and to receive the proclamation. So I will meet down there with you. Wow, all I can say is wowee. This is quite a group, and we are so proud of you all. And I'm so glad you could all show up today. So, are you going to be the spokesperson for right now? Sure. Okay, let me give you an official thing to hold on to. Uh, maybe you can help us pull it out. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words, and then I will present the proclamation? Well, you pretty much summed it up. Every year during Fire Prevention Week, we like to highlight one particular fire prevention topic. And this year is working smoke alarms save lives. And then we also need to make sure that not only do we make sure we have them, but we have to test them every month. So putting them in is the first big step, but you have to test them every month to make sure they're working. Because if they're not working, they don't do you any good at all. So. That's pretty much the message this year. Um, and as the engine companies and the ambulances are out when we're going to calls or if we're you know, in a residence, we're you know, checking, making sure that they have a smoke alarm, reminding them to check it or we'll check it for them when we're on scene of a call just to help out. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Okay, on with the proclamation. Uh, this is honoring Fire Prevention Week, October 5 through the 11th, 2014. Whereas the city of Rancho Mirage is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting our city, the fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are where people are at the greatest risk to fire. And whereas, according to the nonprofit National Fire Protection Association, almost 60% of reported fire home fires deaths and 2000, from 2007 to 2011 resulted from fires in homes 
with no smoke alarm or no working smoke alarm. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half, and whereas in fires considered large enough to activate the smoke alarm, hardwired alarms operated 93% of the time, while battery powered alarms operated only 79% of the time. And whereas when smoke alarms fail to operate, it is usually because batteries are missing, disconnected or dead. And whereas an ionization smoke alarm is generally more responsive to flaming fires and a photoelectric smoke alarm is generally more responsive to smoldering fires, for the best protection or where extra time is n needed to awaken or assist others, both types of alarms or combination ionization and photoelectric alarms are recommended. And whereas the 2014 Fire Prevention Week theme, Smoke Alarms Save Lives, Test Yours Every Month, effectively serves to remind us this week and throughout the year to develop and practice fire prevention and safety by installing and maintaining a working smoke alarm in our homes. Now therefore, I, Iris Smotrich, Mayor of the City of Rancho Mirage, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby proclaim October 15th through the 11th, 2014, as Fire Prevention Week throughout the City of Rancho Mirage and urge all the people of Rancho Mirage to practice fire prevention and safety by installing and maintaining a working smoke alarm in their home and to support the many safety activities and efforts of Rancho Mirage fire and emergency services. So needless to say, the operative words are working smoke, smoke alarm. Yes. yes, if they don't work, it's not gonna help. Exactly. So I thank you so oh, much. Thank you very much. And Iris, Iris, maybe the captain could introduce his team. I'm Captain Jay Ringoffer from Fire Station 69 off of Gerald Ford. Engineer Robert Snow from the Station 1 here on, on the 111. Engineer Nye, paramedic with uh, Ranch Mirage Station 69. Firefighter Charles Essing, Station 69. Firefighter Tom McBride, paramedic, working uh, your fire station 69, Rancho Mirage. Firefighter paramedic Kyle Party from uh, Rancho Mirage Station 1. Firefighter Chad Ayotte, um, working out of Rancho Mirage Fire Station 1. Firefighter paramedic Michael Lionheart, working at Station 69, Rancho Mirage. Very nice. Thank you all so much. And let me give this to you. And Madam Mayor, maybe uh, Casey Hartman can mention the MDA fill-a-boot program. Yes, this weekend um, at the river, we're going to be doing a MDA fill-a-boot drive for the Muscular Dystrophy Association um, from 11 to 3 each day, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So if you can make your way down there, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. And thank you for reminding me to bring that up.
Thank you all again, gentlemen. These are the people that we depend on to save our lives and our homes, and uh, they do remarkable work, and we are so indebted to them. Okay, uh, moving on to the next item. Uh, this is the introduction of the Rancho Mirage Emergency Preparedness Commission. And we have a number of people that are down here, and we would like to have them come up in just a moment. Um, the Emergency Preparedness Commission, I know, is something that I have spoken about so often and uh, is so important to our whole community as well as our entire Coachella Valley. Our commission consists of 15 members and two technical advisors who are appointed by the City Council. The commission was established in 1998 to effectively deal with the possibility of man-made or natural emergencies such as major earthquakes, floods, extended power outages, terrorism, hazardous material, and other problems. The Commission's main purpose is to prepare and train citizens and businesses <coughs> to prepare for any possible emergency. It has progressed from an advisory body to an operational task force. And I must say that they have done remarkable work, and uh, I'm anxious to have them join me down in front, and they can each say a few words and uh, let us know um, the work they're doing. So I'll meet you down in front. very, very proud of, and our whole city is very proud of you. Uh, I will just say a few words about each one of you, and then I'll let you say a few words about yourselves. Um, Bibi Cortez, our, one of our newest members, has two children, a BS degree, and a uh, RE license. Uh, she has worked in a lobby firm, state and set assembly, and a former city council member. She is vice president of Sandbag and SCAG member. She's a Coachella Valley member of the American Legion, and she is a lovely addition to our group. Brenda Weinstock, who unfortunately is unable to be here because of uh, being under the weather, is a recently retired school administrator from Los Angeles. She is, uh, was based as a principal. She has a great deal of experience in preparing students and staff and parents for all kinds of major disasters, including earthquakes, fire, lockdowns, bomb scares, which apparently she has specialized in, and even floods. Next is Claudia Fawcett. Raise your hand a little bit so we can see who you are. Claudia's focus is on the homeowner associations participating in emergency preparedness. And she's been getting MAP Your Neighborhood, a great program established in as many HOAs as possible. She's done yeoman's work and contacting people just endlessly. We, we just, she needs 10 gold stars. Anyway, Dr. Paul Kopsky, right next to me on the right. Um, he has practiced sports medicine for 35 years and is USA Track and Field's medical director for Southern California. His field treatment of athletics injuries mimics typical first response treatments done by CERT members in emergencies, making him the perfect candidate for the Emergency Preparedness Commission and even better as the Race to Be Ready director. Next is Megan Lee, and Megan is married to this very nice gentleman, Paul Kopsky, and she manages her husband's business 
uh, sports practice for 35 years. She used to organize her skills to create health festivals and even manage public multiple ballet productions. She is sharing her skills in creating and implementing Rancho Mirage's Race to Be Ready. And she also has reached out, even especially to the schools and getting kids to do their uh, drawings last year for which we gave out awards. So she has done an amazing job also. Jim McFarlane, one of our newest people. He is a former Air Force officer and computer executive. He is a writer and sought after international speaker on the subject of cyber, secur cyber security and cyber terrorism, something we all are learning about, unfortunately. His columns appear in the Homeland Security News, and he is cyber security columnist for Security Week magazine. His recent novel, a thriller addressing the consequences following cyber attacks on America's power grid, is titled appropriately, Aftershock. In the Emergency Preparedness Commission, Jim will focus on communications with our residents and our city and our Emergency Preparedness Commissioner partners. And Mary Lou Souter. Uh, Mary Lou is a nonprofit professional who has served our area residents through organizations that assist senior citizens, people who are food insecure, and students who are the children of agricultural workers. Mary Lou lives at the Colony in Rancho Mirage, where she is vice president of the HOA, and where she has re-energized their emergency preparedness committee to serve the residents of the colony, which has 220 homes. She's been a remarkable force over there, and we thank her so much. Anyway, uh, Marsha has got the microphone. I did not introduce Marsha. Uh, I guess. Because Marsha can say a few words. About her, myself. About <laughs> herself. <laughs> and, uh, but, I, but I will say a few words first, okay. because I have known Marsha since I came to the desert. Marsha has never been in an organization where she has not been the leader. I am thoroughly convinced in that. And the finest leadership you cannot ask for. Marsha is at the helm of everything. Anybody that uh, needs to have a job done, Marsha is the one to get it off the ground and rolling. And she will pull you into anything she can <laughs> of, worth, of, why, of, of a worthwhile nature. And she is someone we are thoroughly proud of. Oh, so thank, thank you, you. Marsha. Thank you. I, I am just, um, thank you, Iris. Well, thanks to Iris, I have this position. <laughs> I don't know, sometimes I wonder how I ever said yes. <laughs> but truly, it's such an important organization. We as a commission do more, I think, than any other commission in the sense of our work being so important to our residents. And so many people are unaware of the dangers of living in the Coachella Valley. So we do serve an incredible, incredibly important um, role. And I have to say, we're so lucky to not only have Britt as our, our liaison, our staff person, but also Dr. Maletti. Dr. Dennis Maletti is an expert on earthquakes. He travels all over the world as an expert speaking about earthquakes. And he lives in Rancho Mirage, so he's part of our commission. Talk about an expert. Wow. We know more than we ever wanted to know, I think. <laughs> right? Yeah. After last week, but we're so fortunate to have Dr. Mletty. He's traveling right now as an expert. He's asked to speak all over the world, so we're thrilled. And in a minute, I'll introduce Britt. Um, I just want to say that um, this is an important commission. We are available to the city of Rancho Mirage for anyone that feels they need more information. They can contact Britt at City Hall, and one of my wonderful commissioners will go out and talk to them. Our most important role right now is to reach out to the homeowners and many of them we've not contacted for various reasons. So hopefully anyone that's listening to this on Channel 17 will contact Britt, and we can certainly make an arrangement for you to be more informed about what you need to know living in the Coachella Valley. And then now I'd like to introduce Britt. 
Okay, thank you, Madam Chair and Mayor Smotrich. Uh, thank you. It's uh, great to uh, to be the staff liaison to this particular commission. It is a very, very hardworking commission, as all our commissions are. But these people really, they go out, they pound the street, they'll, they'll walk up and down in businesses, knock on the doors, hand out brochures. We went to the Housing Authority properties the other day and made a presentation. So these guys really, really work hard. We have our signature event, the Race to Be Ready, the Emergency Preparedness Town Hall Forum. So it's uh, great to be a liaison to such an active and uh, important commission. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. And I would like to also mention uh, for those people who do not get the e-blast put out by the library that there's going to be an event dedicated to children, to children and their, their interests and their parents' interests. So everything will be presented on that le level from paramedics that are going to be appearing. They're even going to bring some emergency equipment in the way of either a, a fire engine or an ambulance. So we're really thrilled about that. It just shows how much our city is reaching out to everyone of all ages and how important safety and protection is for our entire Coachella Valley. Thank you again, and thank you all for coming. And we will see you at the next meeting. No, no, this is an event that is going to be held at the library. Oh, it was yesterday. So next year, everyone, <laughs> next year. Boy, it, the time goes by when you're having fun. Next year, put it on your calendar, check into it at the library, and David will keep us informed about all these different events. So thank you again. All right. Have a great day. Madam Mayor, as you're making your way back up, um, if I could take the liberty of introducing Erin Sassy. Uh, she will be providing a legislative update for the City Council's um, listening pleasure. Erin Sassy is uh, the Regional Public Affairs Manager for the Riverside County Division of the League of California Cities. Okay. Sorry, I was trying to figure out the microphone here. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm really happy to be here to give you this legislative update. Um, it's the end of a two-year session. Tuesday night at midnight was the deadline for the governor to act on the 1,074 bills that made it to his desk this year. Um, before I go into the update on how we fared this year, I did want to make a couple of other announcements. Um, I wanted to let all of you know that Councilmember Kite was uh, elected to our Mayors and Council Members Academy to serve as their second vice president for this upcoming year, so that's very exciting. He's also going to be serving on our Riverside Division Executive Committee as a board member as well, so you're very well represented within the league, um, and I know he'll do a great job representing the whole area um, for us statewide. Um, and so with that, I just want to say congratulations officially. I'm not sure if any of you saw the news coverage also, but there was a decision made um, relating to CalPERS and the city of Stockton yesterday. We are waiting for the official ruling in writing, which we don't think we'll receive until the end of October, um, because we, we want to see what's in writing before we make our f final decisions. But based on what was said in the hearing yesterday, there are definitely some potential long-term implications for the CalPERS debt, um, basically, it said that a debtor can submit a plan of adjustment and that potentially um, a city or a debtor could reduce their payments to employees and to CalPERS. So more information will be coming out on that once we can see what that decision says um, in writing. But on to our legislative update. Like I said, the governor had 1,074 bills make it to his desk this year. He vetoed his second lowest percentage since he's been in office as governor um, going back both terms, he vetoed 13.3% of the bills that made it to him. The league had 33 priority bills that made it to his desk this year. Overall, the governor signed 15 of the bills that we supported. He signed four bills that we opposed, and he vetoed 11 bills that we supported and vetoed three bills that we opposed. So we fared fairly well. There are some issues that um, I would like to point out. 
On the economic development front, the governor did sign a couple of bills that we we're very happy about. One is SB 628. It would create an alternative ex existing infrastructure finance district. They're calling it an enhanced infrastructure finance district. Um, basically, this would allow local agencies to develop infrastructure funded by tax increment revenue. Um, with some additional conditions. There's already been infrastructure finance district law on the books, but it wasn't very usable, so this just makes it a little bit easier. He also signed another bill by Senator Wolk, SB 614, which would allow a local agency until January 1st of 2025 to use tax increment financing in a newly formed, re re newly formed or reorganized district to fund infrastructure improvement projects. Um, this is for disadvantaged and, and unincorporated communities. So that was a positive note for us. He also um, did, we did prevail in some labor relations bills. There was one bill in particular that was incredibly important that he vetoed. It was one of our hot bills. Um, basically this would have allowed the collective bargaining process to provide preferential treatment, leverage and delay mechanisms to public employee organizations to determine the use of public employees and the responsibility to make good decisions to local taxpayers. The governor in his veto message on this bill um, acknowledged his prior city service, which is definitely a good thing he referenced, um, but when he was the mayor of Oakland, he said that the negotiating process between labor and management seems extraordinarily robust and extensive. Along this line, he also opposed three league-opposed workers' compensation bills that would have just increased the costs and placed additional burdens on cities, so that's definitely a positive um, step for us as well. There are a couple other bills that we were disappointed with. Um, the governor did sign a bill that would have created a costly uniform um, vehicle and badge requirement for local agencies providing health and public safety contracts. That was SB 556. And then he also um, vetoed a bill, AB 2493, which would have authorized redevelopment bond proceeds for infrastructure and housing projects um, for the planning stages before the dissolution of redevelopment. There were several bills that had to do with redevelopment law that he did veto, but he left the door open for some potential reworking in the future. One of the bills was incredibly important to us. It was AB 2280 by Alejo. This is a bill that we've worked on for several years. Um, basically, the governor vetoed it because he felt that the new legislation shouldn't be within redevelopment law. So I think next year we have an opportunity to maybe revisit the issue, but put it somewhere in a different code section. Um, he also vetoed a couple of other redevelopment bills. One was by Senator Steinberg that would have just cleaned up the redevelopment process. That one um, we think the door is open for as well next year, so that's something that we'll likely work on moving forward. There were a couple other bills. One, two of them were, it's a combination package um, that was incredibly important to our region. The four newest cities in the state of California are all in Riverside County. They're on the western side, but they're, like I said, all in Riverside County. It's the cities of Eastvale, Harupa Valley, Menifee, and Wildemar. Um, in 2011, when public safety realignment was passed, the funding mechanism actually took revenues from cities that were had new incorporations and then cities that had an uninhabited or inhabited annexations um, and that money funded the realignment. So we've been working since 20, 2011 to get this funding restored and unfortunately the governor did veto this, those bills again this year. Um, what that means for our region is those cities have had inadequate services, um, their public safety has been jeopardized. Harupa Valley's been talking about disincorporating. It means that those cities that had those inhabited annexations won't be able to recover those funding as well. So really unfortunate um, for the state and for our region. At this point, the way that the law is written, it really doesn't allow for any future incorporations of cities. So um, hopefully that's something that will get it fixed eventually, but I'm, I'm just not sure at this point how much further these cities will pursue this fix. Um, with that, like I said, there's a lot of bills that happened. Um, I could, we'd be happy to provide some more detailed information to you in writing. I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have, but overall we didn't do too bad, um, and we'll be working on some of those redevelopment issues next year as we move forward. Well, thank you so much, Erin. Can I ask a, a I question? What was the league's position on the uh, the bill that provided 
uh, public safety uh, individuals with 100% pension retirement in the event of certain kinds of uh, injuries or additional injuries? Uh, we were, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but that was a bill that we opposed, um, and I believe it was signed. I can get back to you on that, though, but I, I do think that was one of the bills that was signed. Is, does the league have a, um, a pamphlet of some sort that outlines the information that you've given us and shows us where the league's position was on those issues? Yes. I actually think that you probably already, I think you have them, right? I think I emailed them out. Um, then I'm not speaking to you, I'll speak to whoever. <laughs> but it would be it would be nice if uh, the council could receive a copy of uh, those, uh, Summaries. those pamphlets or one Absolutely. pamphlet. Yeah, it, it just came out yesterday, so yeah. definitely make sure it gets yet? to you. Mm. Yeah, you haven't got it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I think it's also on the internet. I, I think I sent a copy of that to Randy and to Isaiah. Yeah. So you should be getting but, it. But we can, we can package that as a link, absolutely. Yeah, we right. can get hard copies right. of it. Sure. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Just one last item. We have our golf tournament coming up on the 13th. I hope you can all make our dinner at 5.30 at Tuckwet Canyon. Um, should be a good event. Any other questions from council? Okay. Well, Thank you, you for having me. You always do such a lovely job, and it's nice to be informed and updated on all these items. And uh, look forward to seeing you at all these events. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Moving right along here, uh, we're now on to non-agenda public comments. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to make any quest comments or ask any questions or talk about anything that's not on our agenda? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public comments and move on to city council board member comments. Is there anyone on the council that would like to uh, address something? Okay. You're all jumping in at one time. Okay. Well, as usual, I have something to say. Okay. I, I know that this, this is a, a short agenda, so we, we will probably be out of here fairly soon. And for all those people that eat lunch or dinner at 3 o'clock, um, you probably won't have any problem making that. So uh, the first thing I wanted to make mention is uh, at our library, we have obviously a wonderful library and a wonderful uh, librarian and director. And the October, November, December program guide of the award-winning Rancho Mirage Public Library is now available here at City Hall or at the library or online at RanchoMirageLibrary.org. And Randy is being very helpful. And I, can, I have one, too, so we can do it together. Uh, and on the cover, there's a beautiful picture of Marilyn Monroe. And uh, the guide has won the California Library Associate Award for the best library program publication in California this year. Quite remarkable. Thank you very much. Uh, this issue is full of great concerts, lectures, film screenings, even a theater event, oddly enough, called Marilyn Madness and Me. Uh, it is going to be held on November 19th at the library, and programs are funded, as always, by the Library Foundation and individual donors. So please look at the new issue. You will be very impressed, uh, as we all are. Dave, David and his staff do a, a, an incredible job uh, bringing these programs to our library, and the Coachella Valley um, doesn't hesitate to show up en masse uh, to enjoy the wonderful events, so thank you again. Okay, the other item I wanted to mention was something that was put on at the library also, and this was the Rancho Mirage Small Business Seminar and Resource Expo, and this was to help small businesses succeed. It was held Tuesday, September 23rd, and it is a, an all-day thing from 9 to 2.45. They will be doing it again next year, hopefully, and the year after. And they had a wonderful turnout with wonderful speakers. And they addressed items such as basic sales and use tax, better business through better records, forms of ownership, employee or independent contractor, and does the SBA have a loan program for my business? 
So if you are an existing business owner or you're starting up a new business, please don't hesitate to stop by next year and uh, enjoy everything it has to offer. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to our non-minutes because we do not, <laughs> our non-minutes because something disastrous happened to our minutes and unfortunately now Cindy Scott has to start, start over and it's, it was like one of those things where the dog ate it, but this time it was the computer, her new computer that ate it. And unfortunately, she has to start over with the minutes, so those will be pre presented at the next city council meeting. Okay, uh, moving on again to consent items. And this is the consent calendar, and before we start with that, with Randy, is there anyone that wanted to pull anything? Because we only have three items. So number one is the mobile home fair practices activity report. And uh, that was presented, uh, the staff report by Linda Hodge. Let's go ahead, Madam Mayor, and I'll do the consent calendar for number two and three, and then we'll have Linda make that presentation on number one. Okay. I feel for Cindy, we've all been in that situation. You type up a whole document, and then it doesn't save, and you lose it. Yeah. And it's just out there, and you have to start all over. So you'll see those minutes on the 16th. Great. All right, so your two items are your contracts and your demands, and we're here to answer any questions on consent. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Please vote. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart, could you try your vote again? Thank you. Okay. Uh, motion carries 5 0. Thank you so much. And now going on to Linda Hodge. Uh, she is our housing specialist and she's going to present the staff report. Thank you very much. Activity report for Ranch Mirage Mobile Home. Can you speak home. a little louder? Oh, I'm sorry. Activity report for Rancho Mirage Mobile Home Parks for a portion of fiscal year 2013. Okay, thank you. The activity report is submitted to comply with Chapter 9.58.070F of the Rancho Mirage Municipal Code. The activity report is a semi-annual summary which informs the Council of activities, rulings, actions, results of hearings and other matters that have occurred during the identified period pertaining to all mobile home parks located in the city. This activity report covers the remainder of the last physical year ending June 30th, 2014. On September 18th, 2014, the activity report was presented at the Mobile Home Fair Practices Commission meeting. At this time, no commission action was required for any of the mobile home parks. The commission recommended the activity report to be received and filed by the council. Okay. Do we have any questions from council? Okay. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Audience questions are closed. We'll move back to the council. And move or receive it and file. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and second. Please vote. Okay. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to. Madam Mayor, so, uh, pub excuse me for interrupting. Public hearing, yeah. uh, item number four, staff recommends continuance. This is the dog park discussion that is still at the Planning Commission level. Uh, they will be taking up the issue on October 9th. Okay, thank you, Randy. So you do need to open the hearing on this, and if anyone wants to speak on the continuance rather than the project itself, you can open the hearing and then close it. Thank you. Yes, we do have four people that wish to speak. Uh, first will be Haynes. Schreiber, Schreiber. Schreiber. 
And would you state your name and where you, your city in which yes. you live? Yes, yes. My name is Hannes Schrauber, and I'm a resident and homeowner at Key Lago Estates, 106 Clearwater Way. And to be honest with you, I'm part of a group of concerned citizens of the city of Ranch Mirage, homeowners of the city of Ranch Mirage, that are here to make, make sure that there will be a continuance in regards to the proposed dog park development. A lot of us are dog lovers, but we think the location for this dog park is absolutely wrong. And uh, other parts of this group will actually present some studies for you that were done by other cities, as the city of Seattle or the University of California, Davis, uh, that will actually show you that the location that we have for many different reasons, including noise exposure, wind exposure, uh, crime aspect, you know, is absolutely wrong for, for the pro uh, proposed pro uh, development that you have in mind there. So therefore, I'm gonna be handing over the microphone, if that's okay then with you, to Mr. Ron Peterson, who actually has some supporting documents to our position. Okay, Ron Peterson. Uh. So as, as a reminder, the item is not on the agenda today for action. It's a recommendation for continuance. There is no staff presentation. The project is still at the Planning Commission level and will be heard at the Council after the Planning Commission has taken action and, and it's scheduled for the October 9th meeting. So if you could keep your comments to the, the continuance itself, we'd appreciate it. Well, I guess I, I'm not sure I understand the question um, or actually the statement because I, I've presented, I guess, my thoughts in the past. Um, I've got more from several people in my community. Um, are you telling me that I can't present my information now, or would it be more appropriate to present at the planning meeting? Okay. Let me check because, with my uh, legal consultant. Okay. Because the public hearing is uh, going to be continued, any comments you make about the merits of the dog park proposal will technically not be part of the record. Okay the official record with respect to the public hearing. Okay, so basically at this stage of the game, I should probably leave the um, data that I've assembled alone and just say that I've pulled several members of my community and characteristically, virtually all of them are still gone but are coming soon, so I emailed them and virtually all of them were against the dog park. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, the next person, is Joseph DePuzzo? Okay, thank you so much. And the next person is Kurt Hanschel. Kurt Hanschel. And I'll go along with Mr. DePuzzo since I have no comments on the continuance of it. And I agree and save our remarks for the time. Okay, so you'll save your remarks for the next thank you. time. Thank you. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Madam Chairman, I would, yes. I would move uh, if there are no other speakers. I would. Oh, no. I, would I would move that uh, we uh, continue the uh, consideration of the preliminary development plan for a three acre dog park to the next meeting of the City Council, which will be after the Planning Commission has a chance to uh, consider the matter. Okay, we have a motion, and I will second that. So please cast Madam your. Mayor, I think you yes, need sir. To close the public hearing. Okay, all right, before we vote, then we'll just close the public hearing as long as we, I do not, do not have any uh, further cards that I have received up here. So if there's anyone that w wishes to say something that did not fill out a card, now would be the time. Otherwise, if seeing none, uh, public hearing will be closed. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Richard. And now please cast your vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. Right. So mo moving on to item number uh, five. And this will be uh, handled by Bruce Harry from our Public Works Director. Uh, this is the awarding of a contract for annual heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, HVAC, maintenance services. Bruce, thank you, thank Madam you. Mayor members of the council. On August 11th of this year, staff released a request for proposals to solicit the best overall proposal from qualified 
heating, ventilating, and air conditioning contractors to perform comprehensive heating, ventilating, and air conditioning preventative maintenance and repair services for city-owned buildings, which includes the city hall, the city library, city yard, city annex, and two of the city's fire stations. The recommended contractor will maintain the efficiency, safety, and rated capacity of all the building HVAC systems, including the automated controls. A comprehensive HVAC maintenance services contract is essential, is an essential component of responsible facilities management. Proactive maintenance is critical to avoiding unnecessary disruptions due to the failure of the HVAC systems. This contract requires an aggressive, comprehensive preventative maintenance plan, which is designed to reduce HVAC downtime and extraordinary repair costs. It also requires emergency on-call services 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Five proposals were, re were received prior to the deadline on September 10th. Staff re reviewed each of the five proposals and found two of the proposals to be non-responsive for reasons that I've identified in the staff report on page 5-2. The remaining three proposals found to be responsive were reviewed and evaluated based on criteria outlined in the request for proposals. The evaluation criteria included review of the proposer's annual preventative maintenance and extra work costs, review of the proposer's comprehensive preventative maintenance plan, review, review of the proposer's qualifications and work experience, review of the proposer's ability to support and maintain the HVAC automated control system, review of the proposer's ability to provide the qualified staff necessary to perform all the requirements of the contract, and review of the proposer's references. MCOR Services Mesa Energy Systems Incorporated achieved the highest ranking by the review committee based on the aforementioned criteria. I'd like to mention some additional information that I did not include in my staff report that I think might be helpful to the council. The overall cost of the city for an HVAC contract is broken down into two components, the preventative maintenance side and the extraordinary maintenance. So the, the work that is done on the, on the monthly service, which they do on a monthly basis, and then any extraordinary, which would be replacement of equipment and things like that. After review of the last three years' uh, maintenance expenses, the annual extraordinary maintenance costs have equated to nearly three times the cost of the annual maintenance fee. Mm -hmm. So that's an important fact to remember here. The extra work accounts for three times more than the annual uh, fee that we pay just for preventative maintenance. With that said, staff placed, an, placed extra weight on the proposer's extra work markup rates on materials and labor costs, which, which the proposers itemized in their bid proposals. Based on MCOR Service Mesa Energy Systems Incorporated, uh, sub, they had substantially lower extra work material markups and labor rates, and their rates also will include uh, the uh, cost for their vehicles to, to uh, get to the site, which some of the other proposers did not include in their hourly rates. Those vehicle costs would be added on to the hourly rates. Uh, adequate funding for this contract is currently allocated in this fiscal year's budget. Should the City Council approve staff, re staff recommendation today, MCOR Services Mesa Energy Systems Incorporated stands ready to commence work immediately following contract execution. Um, I have uh, some uh, information. Um, the uh, contractor is actually in the audience today, the low bidder. He requested if he could be here, and I said he could. Um, and uh, if there's any questions of me or the contractor, we're happy to answer them. That concludes my staff report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Okay. Yes, I have some questions, have, oh, Bruce. Good. <clears throat> the first two of the lower bidders, Bruce, uh, Rivco Mechanical and Evolution Mechanical, uh, they were about $12,000 under the next lowest bid. Uh, what was it about them that made them non-responsive? What did they not include that would have been an additional expense uh, that we should have been billed for in their uh, proposal? Okay, on page, the bottom of page 5-2 of the staff report, I noted that Rivco Mechanical and Evolution Mechanical were now responsive. Simply, uh, Rivco Mechanical did not follow the proposal submitted requirements. They only submitted the proposal bid page. They didn't submit a work plan, any references, any qualifications of their contractors. 
any uh, certification showing they can maintain our turbo core chiller and our automated control system. So they're, basically their proposal was non-responsive. Mm -hmm. They didn't submit any of the required documentation that uh, the three that we uh, reviewed did. Um, the second, uh, Evolution Mechanical, failed to uh, acknowledge addendum number two, which included a, a massive amount of additional work that was to be added in their monthly cost for preventative maintenance. For example, uh, annual service of the chillers, the replacement of all of the filters. They were required to purchase all filters and install them. Annual servicing on the chillers, which runs probably a good $3,000 per chiller for City Hall here and another 3000 for the, the library. So by not signing addendum two, they did not include those figures in their bid and therefore their bid was considered non-responsive. Okay, with respect then to F.M. Thomas, whose bid was about three, almost $3,000 less than MCOR, the one you have picked, uh, what is it that MCOR will do that uh, F.M. Thomas wouldn't do for $3,000 cheaper? I mean, you mentioned subjective qualities uh, in, in your list of criteria that you used to consider Thomas over, uh, I mean, uh, MCOR over Thomas air conditioning. Uh, um, what is it that Thomas air conditioning should have known or could have done added to their proposal that would have made their low bid, which you found to be responsive, but then you find is not uh, not acceptable. Uh, what is it they should have done or could have done to uh, get an award that normally they should be entitled to get because they're the low bidder? Yeah, like I m was trying to mention on this added information I gave the council today, the maintenance contract is basically two components. You have a fixed component, which is preventative maintenance, which is what you see here in their bid. This is on fixed work that they do on a monthly basis. They know what the services are, and they bid so much money to do that work. The second component is extra work, where they run into things, for example, a pump goes out, a fan coil doesn't work, um, you have chiller problems with the automation system, you have to replace m components of the um, HVAC system. Those are things that you can't put in your preventative maintenance contract because you don't know when they're going to occur and you don't know what the cost would be to do the work until they survey the situation and then they give you a proposal. Well, since this is a one-year contract, what do you think isn't going to last one year? Well, we're averaging, like I mentioned. Um, goes to, it can be optioned to yeah. four more. And we're, 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 we're averaging $103,000 a year in extraordinary maintenance. And the preventative maintenance contract is about 47000 of that. So as you can see, if you look at the total cost picture of the preventative plus the extraordinary, the buildings are getting older, so we expect that cost to re be relatively the same or if not more. And another component of the bidding was a markup percentage on parts and equipment and also labor. And FM Thomas had the highest markup of all bidders on all those parts. They were marking up parts 100%. Um, MCOR, on the other hand, had some of the lowest percentage markups. So we're seeing a lot of the cost that's driving our HVAC costs up on the extraordinary maintenance. And this contractor, FM Thomas, that we currently have, has been averaging around $103,000 a year in extra work. Um, I don't know how much of that could have been prevented with better preventative maintenance, but we feel that based on the overall criteria that we looked at, both the monthly and the extraordinary maintenance, MCOR services is going to be a cheaper contract for us annually. How long have we had MCOR? We haven't had MCOR. MCOR oh, is a you said, I, FM I must Thomas. Have misunderstood you. FM Thomas, we've, they've been here for eight years, and we've not done an RFP for eight years. And currently they're working on a month-to-month -month with us. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. In the case of... Um, Rivco and Evolution Mechanical, uh, whose bids obviously are incomplete. Uh, they're $14,000 less, obviously, than the bid that was selected. In the case where their bid is inadequate or incomplete, are they notified as to the reason for the deficiency and then requested to 
fill that void in order to come back up? No, the, the, way, the way the RFPs are done, and that wouldn't be fair to the other proposers who now all the numbers are known by everybody. Everybody knows everybody's numbers. So these are almost like these are sealed proposals when they come in. We review them. Um, we don't give bidders typically an opportunity to get back in compliance with what they should have done in the first place. If we were to do that, we're, we're going to have a hard time getting people to even want to propose on our projects in the future because we're always going to give somebody else um, basically a second chance to get their proposal to where they may get the contract. Um, the the um, RIVCO proposal, I have never seen a proposal so incomplete in all the years I've been here on RFPs. They basically filled out the bid sheet and turned it in. No references, no, I mean, there was nothing to review their proposal by other than price. Um, the Evolution Mechanical, they're certainly low because they didn't acknowledge Addendum 2, which added a tremendous cost to the monthly uh, service fee. So obviously their proposal is low. Um, but we need to continue with the way that we review proposals and bids where they have to be completed when they're submitted on a particular date and time, and then we review them from there based on their completeness. So I wouldn't ever recommend that we give people second chances, especially when numbers can be gotten out and everyone knows their pricing, and that's not fair to the other proposers. Yeah, well, my question was based on non-disclosure. Obviously, it, it wouldn't be appropriate if the numbers were known and published and, and the bids were recognized. It would only be if you recognized a bid came in before all of them were opened and you said, you know, I see that you're missing A, B, and C. Uh, do you want Do you want to complete your the the process? That that's more my thought. Yeah. That who who's to say that they may not have been able to fulfill yeah. it? Well, that that also tells me how responsible the contractor is. Do I really want him dealing with my systems if he's forgetful? I'm putting his own proposal together, which is which is part of his business. These guys put these together all the time to get work. And the, the, it was pretty straightforward. Uh, three of the five got it perfectly correct. So. Good. Thank you. <coughs> Richard, Richard you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, just to follow up, uh, Bruce, mm -hmm. you're indicating that if there are problems during the coming year uh, where material will have to be replaced or additional material purchased, that uh, Thomas Air Conditioning charges more, has a higher rate for those kinds of items. Correct. Are you saying that if, if um, MCOR had been the company that, instead of uh, Thomas Air, that MCOR had been our company over the last year, that our cost would have been cheaper, would have been lesser, uh, if MCOR had been there because they charge less for the various items that uh, had to be replaced or work that had to be done? Yes, if, if, if MCOR was doing the contract based on these markups for extra work, they, that the prices would have come in cheaper than FM We would Thomas. have saved about how much money? We would have saved about $35,000, I figured, okay. when, I, when I look at the percentages. Okay. It's not Thank a whole you. lot of money, but well, certainly we certainly- 35000 here, 35000 there, yeah. way. Pretty soon you got enough to take a trip to Lake Arrowhead. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Okay. Um, um, Bruce, how often do we put out these RFPs? Well, this one here um, hasn't been out for since 2009, I think, when FM Thomas got it, but they've been our contractor for eight years now. Um, this contract here will be a, a yearly contract, but it'll be able to be extended on a yearly basis based on performance up to four years. Um, so I would say every five years we should be routinely going out to RFP on all of our maintenance contracts. We want to make sure that we get the best qualified and the best price. So that's our standard practice now is to turn these things over minimum every five years or every year if the contractor is not performing to our satisfaction. Okay. So this is a new program, the way you look at that's these correct. contracts. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And I certainly applaud you for that. I think that's an, an important uh, addition to the RFP process. Thank you. I think we all applaud you and thank you so much for taking care of that. No other comments? Any comments from the audience? Okay. Seeing none, we'll just move right on. If we can get a, uh, a motion and a second. 
Somebody, okay, I will move that the, uh, the City Council award the contract for annual comprehensive heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, HVAC maintenance service for city owed, owned buildings to MCOR Services Mesa Energy Systems Incorporated in the amount of $47,963. Is there a second? Second. Okay, please vote. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. And now moving on to item number six. And this is also something from Bruce Harry uh, from our Public Works Department. And this is the awarding of contracts for annual citywide landscape maintenance services. Bruce, will you take it? Thank you, Please. Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, this is a, a, the third of our, uh, the last of our three RFPs that we have gone out to. We did one last meeting, which was on our janitorial, and today we're doing the HVAC and the landscaping. Um, on August 20th, staff released our request for proposals to solicit qualified landscape maintenance contractors to perform landscape maintenance and irrigation repair services for city-owned facilities, which include the city hall, city library, city yard, city annex, city parks, the two fire stations, the citywide street median islands, that's all the medians on our streets, uh, city maintained parkways along Highway 111, and the five special uh, landscape benefit maintenance districts that we have in our landscaping lighting district program. The proposers were asked to provide monthly maintenance costs and staff allocations for three maintenance areas identified as areas A, B, and C. Area A includes the street medians, Area B includes the city's parks, city-owned miscellaneous parcels and parkways, and Area C includes all city-owned buildings and the four special benefit zones. A proactive landscape maintenance services contract is essential in providing the lush and efficient landscaping our residents expect. Four proposals were received prior to the September 16th deadline. Staff reviewed the proposals and found all proposals to be responsive. Staff evaluated the proposals based on criteria identified in the RFP, which I've discussed <coughs> further on page 6-2 of the staff report. After review by the evaluation committee, it was determined that all the proposers were well qualified to perform the contract services, and cost would be the final determining factor for making a staff recommendation. Staff reviewed the proposers, staff allocations, and cost proposals for each of the three areas and found them to be competitive. Adequate funds are budgeted in this fiscal year's budget to fund all these three contract areas. Therefore, staff is recommending that areas A and B be awarded to the lowest responsive and responsible proposer, Conserve Land Care Incorporated, and area C be awarded to the lowest responsive and responsible proposer, Kirkpatrick Landscaping Services Incorporated. This concludes my staff report and I'm available to answer any council questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, any questions from the council? Richard? Madam Mayor, um, Bruce, you and I talked a little bit about the awarding of these contracts and if it would be worthwhile to try and uh, utilize conserve on all three of the areas and ask them to bring down their price. You wanna comment on that and why you think it's better to do it this way? Yeah, we, we tried years ago to have one contractor do our entire city, and that was before our city has grown. And it was very difficult for them to provide the man manpower throughout the year, because we're dealing with the agricultural industry out here where the laborers tend to go where the, who pays the highest dollar. And in the landscape maintenance business, um, it's not a very highly paid trade. Um, they make anywhere from eight to $12 an hour. So if they're getting uh, more money to go down and work in the agricultural industry, they'll, they'll, they'll leave. So they have a very difficult time maintaining manpower during certain times of the season. So we felt that it was always best to have a second contractor here so we didn't spread one contractor so thin on his manpower. Mm -hmm. And we found that we have done this uh, since. We've, we have two contractors now. Uh, Conserve maintains um, one of our big areas of the city. And um, the other big area of the city is maintained by Mariposa Landscape, which also proposed on this project, but their prices were a little higher, as you can see. Mm -hmm. But it's worked out very well for us, and it does give, these are very lucrative contracts for these contractors, and um, they have no problem in taking care of these areas the way we have them split up right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> While I see an advantage in having two uh, contractors working here, giving you the options that uh, you've just uh, enumerated, 
Um, I'm glad to see that we got it in the form of bidding in this case, because if Kirkpatrick, uh, who was high, was sec in second position on areas A and B, but which was the low bidder on area C, if he had lost that because of some predilection we have for ha wanting to have two, I'd have been very upset uh, about the low bidder being prevented from getting what he had every right to anticipate he would get, even though we have a reason for it. You know, it's nice to have two around rather than one, but it seems to me it's far more important to keep the bidding process as pure as we possibly can. And I commend you uh, in, uh, in not wanting to have, at first I thought the argument was we, we would want to have all, all three areas represented by the same landscaper. Uh, I was wrong on that. You seem to think, and I certainly have, I agree with you, that it's better to have two and solves other problems. But I'm glad to see that in all three cases we've taken the low bidder without any other uh, approach to it. And I commend you again for that. Any other comments? Okay. And I commend you also. It's, it's always good to know that uh, we are trying to uh, be as economically feasible as possible. So, having said that. All right, I'll make a motion. The uh, audience. Are there any members of the audience who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the audience comments and move to a vote and a motion. I'll make a motion the City Council award contracts for landscape maintenance services for city citywide medians, parks, parkways, city buildings, grounds, and special benefit zones to conserve Land Care Inc. Area A for $168,000, conserve Land Care Inc. Area B for $122,400, and to Kirkpatrick Landscaping Services Inc. Area C for $79,980. Second. Okay. okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Okay, motion passes 5-0. And I thank everyone for attending. I think we did this in record time. So we do not have a closed session. And uh, so at this time, you you have? we have one. No. no. We have one thing listed. No. I know. No. Okay. So we we do not we no longer have a, a closed session. Okay. So uh, you're all free to either go back to work or go take a nap, whichever comes first. <laughs> so. Very good. So we'll see you next time. Have a great week. Thanks. <laughs>